In this lecture, we will discuss powdery mildew of grape. Grape powdery mildew is an economically important disease worldwide, especially in drier climates. In Ohio, powdery mildew is generally less economically important than downy mildew. Unlike black rot and downy mildew, the powdery mildew fungus does not require free water on the plant tissue surface to initiate infections. The learning outcomes for this lecture are to know the causative agent of grape powdery mildew and recognize and describe the signs and symptoms of the disease. You should also be able to recognize and describe the disease cycle and the conditions that favor disease development. Powdery mildew caused by the fungus Uncinula necator can infect all green tissues of the vine and can result in reduced vine growth, yield, fruit quality, and winter hardiness. White powdery mildew growth appears on the upper or lower side of the leaves. The colonies enlarge, coalesce, and cover the entire surface of affected leaves. Severely diseased leaves can curl upwards and shrivel during dry, hot weather. Infected cluster stems may wither and dry up, resulting in berry drop. Infected and sporulating berries have a white powdery sugar-like appearance, as shown in the image on the right. Infections of purple or red cultivars can result in incomplete ripening, and then they fail to color properly. These berries will have a blotchy appearance at harvest. The fungus survives the dormancy of the vine by producing Cleistothecia or by living in its asexual form in dormant grape vine buds. In drier and warmer climates, the fungus can overwinter inside dormant buds and initiate infections in the spring when the buds begin to, to break. However, in the Great Lakes region, overwintering occurs by the formation of Cleistothecia. I should mention that the terminology for Cleistothecia has recently changed and we now use the term Shasmothecia or Shasmothecium. However, either term is correct and I will mostly use Cleistothecium or Cleistothecia. This image shows Cleistothecia at various, various stages of maturity on the leaf surface. Mature Cleistothecia have appendages and are black. Immature Cleistothecia are yellow and brown and do not have fully formed appendages. Again, Cleistothecia can overwinter in bark crevices, but can also overwinter on leaf debris. These images show the developmental stages of a Cleistothecium. Panel A shows the ascocarp that's beginning to form by the fusion of hyphae. Panel B is a close-up of how the hyphae fuse to the ascocarp, as shown by the arrow. In panel C and D, an immature Cleistothecium is shown. And in D, you can see that the immature Cleistothecium is beginning to produce appendages as shown by the arrows. And then E is a mature Cleistothecium on a berry and F is a mature Cleistothecium on a bud scale. And just as a reminder, these Cleistothecia um, can be on any green tissue and cause infections if the environmental conditions are correct. So Cleistothecia Thesia produce ascospores inside asci, and the ascospores are discharged from fall to late spring, depending on the temperature and the amount of precipitation. Cleistothecia mature most rapidly at moder moderate temperatures, and mature Cleistothecia can discharge ascospores from fall through late spring. The graph on the left shows that maturation occurs most rapidly at temperatures between 68 and 70 
7 degrees Fahrenheit and that at 50 degrees Fahrenheit they remain in the immature stage. So if we look at 61 degrees Fahrenheit you can see um, on the on the y-axis is the days to 50 percent in the particular stage they were measuring. So at 61 degrees Fahrenheit at around day 34 you have uh, mature ASCO, uh, mature Cleistothesia and ascospore release. However, at 68 and 77, you only need around 25 days to have 50% in the mature stage. So at those warmer temperatures, you have m more Cleistothesia that are mature, and therefore you would have more spore release. The graph on the right shows that over 50% of the ascospores are released before the buds even break in the spring. It also indicates that earlier fall maturing Cleistothesia produce significantly more ascospores than late fall maturing Cleistothesia. So on this graph, let's find my arrow here, here we go. On the graph you can see that bud, bake, bud break for Chancellor is just over 100, day 100, and, and same for on Chardonnay. Then if you go up from bud break and you go up to look at the line with the closed circles, these are early maturing Cleistothesia. You can see that they resulted in nearly 80% um, of the ascospores being released. Compared to those that matured later, you're only getting about 60% of spore release uh, by the time you have bud break. And the same trend is true for the Chardonnay variety. So even though ascospores can be discharged from fall to late spring, the ascospores discharged in the spring are the primary source of inoculum and the spores that kickstart spring infections. Discharge is initiated if 0.1 inches of rain or a heavy fog occurs and when temperatures are above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Under these conditions, most of the mature ascospores will be discharged within four to eight hours. Ascospores are carried by wind to susceptible tissues including leaves, flowers, berries, and stems. And you can see here that the Cleistothesia has broken and this circular area here is the asci and these are the ascospores within the asci. So once an ascospore initiates infection, in-season disease development occurs by infections from canidia. Repeated infections can occur all season long, making powdery mildew a polycyclic disease. These images show various tissues of the grape um, sporulating and producing new canidia. Panel A shows sporulation on the upper leaf surface, while panel B shows sporulation on the lower leaf surface. Panel C is sporulation on a petiole, and panels E and F are sporulation on inflorescence or the flowers. And I want to point out here that, you know, a, this is a single canidiophore, and each canidiophore will produce one canidium per day for 30 days. So under optimal conditions, a single canidium can grow to a reproductive colony in 7 to 21 days, and each colony can produce 30 canidiophores. Each canidiophore can then produce one canidium a day for 30 days. Therefore, a single canidium results in 900 spores, and each of those spores produces 900 spores. So two generations of a single spore can result in 800 810,000 spores. 
but again, this is only if the environmental conditions are optimal for spore production. The optimal environmental conditions for powdery mildew development encompass what is referred to as the Goldilocks paradox. If conditions are just right, as shown in the purple circles in this image, fungal growth and development is at its peak. So temperatures between 50 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit result in the most infections with the shortest generation time at about 81 degrees. Fahrenheit. At temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, a single heating event can kill powdery mildew colonies. Multiple heating events can also delay sporulation. Ideal relative humidity ranges from 60 to 90 percent and influences how quickly the canidia germinate. The powdery mildew fungus is sensitive to UV light and UV radiative heat and sporulation is optimal when light intensity is low, typically dusk and dawn. In addition, new growing shoots are more susceptible to powdery mildew infections. So all four of these variables will become important when we discuss management strategies. Similar to downy mildew of grape, clusters are most susceptible pre-bloom to three to six weeks post-bloom depending on the cultivar, as I'm showing here in the yellow shaded areas. In the study shown here, inoculations at bloom and when the grapes are two millimeters in size resulted in 80 to 60 percent of the fruit surface colonized by the fungus compared to less than five percent when the fruit were inoculated at the three millimeter size. So if we look at this top bar graph, you have, excuse me, line graph, this is bloom, this is two millimeter fruit size and three millimeter fruit size. So when they were inoculated at bloom, you had 80% uh, of the surface of a cluster that was colonized. When you inoculated at two millimeters bloom, you had around 60%. However, once the fruit got to the three millimeter size, you basically had no disease occur. The graph on the right shows that the infection period is consistent between cultivars and from year to year. So again, in the shaded area here is when you have the most disease occurring. And you can see that in Chardonnay, you have a similar infection periods in 1996 and 97, and the same for Riesling in 1996 and 97. So the fact that this critical period for infections to occur is predictable allows for strategic timing of management strategies. The timing of ascospore release and the Goldilocks paradox must be considered when deciding how to best manage powdery mildew. Although powdery mildew does not require free moisture for spore germination, it does require high levels of relative humidity, again between 60 to 90 percent. Canidia are sensitive to UV light and extreme heat, so canopy management becomes important when managing the disease. However, the fact that clusters are most susceptible to infections from two weeks pre-bloom to up to six weeks post-bloom is really what drives a management program. So in the next lecture, we will discuss how black rot, downy mildew, and powdery mildew can be managed simultaneously by exploiting the critical period of infections for these diseases.